Hey everyone, my name is Tygen Luxon and I'm a uh, certified flight instructor for both sailplanes and airplanes and I'm also a paragliding pilot. So um, over the years I've noticed a lot of paraglider pilots have no idea about airspace. So I thought I'd put together this video to explain kind of briefly the different airspaces that are out there, how to tell where they are and where you're allowed to fly. So we'll go ahead and get started. So this chart right here shows the different airspaces that are in the United States. Um, they're lettered A through G and they skip F. So this chart you can tell on the top here is the most restricted airspace and on the bottom is the least restricted. Everything class E and above is considered controlled airspace. Class G is the only class that's considered uncontrolled airspace. So this chart right here shows you the entry requirements. Um, I'm going to try to gear this towards paraglider and hang glider pilots. So the stuff that pertains only to airplanes, I'm, I'm not going to talk about. But basically, um, the airspaces that we're allowed to fly in are the Class G and Class E airspaces. And also before I really get into this, I wanted to talk about some of the FAA rules for hang glider and uh, paraglider pilots. Um, hang gliders and paragliders are considered by the FAA to be ultralights. So they're regulated by the Section uh, 103. So if you Google FAA part 103, um, you'll be able to find the regulation. So I just basically condensed them real quick so it wouldn't be like a bunch of words on this PowerPoint. But um, the big ones are um, 103.9, daylight operations. You must fly between sunrise and sunset. There is an exception, though. You can fly in uncontrolled airspace, so that's the Class G airspace, uh, for 30 minutes before or after sunrise and sunset if you have an anti-collision light. Um, the next one is operations near aircraft. Um, you must see and avoid uh, other aircraft and give way to other aircraft. It also says that you are responsible to um, make sure you're flying somewhere that you won't get into a conflict with an aircraft. Um, 103.15 is operations over congested area. Uh, we're not allowed to fly over congested area in the uh, vicinity of a city, town, settlement, or over any open air assembly of persons. So this is like, say there's a rodeo or something outside and there's a bunch of people or a concert. We're not allowed to fly over that either. The next one is operations in certain airspace. So this is what I had talked about a second ago. We're not allowed to fly in class A, B, C, D airspaces. We're also not allowed to fly in prohibited airspace or restricted airspace. Um, and then or within the lateral boundaries of the surface area of Class E airspace designated for an airport unless we get prior authorization from ATC. So I know that probably didn't make any sense, so I'm going to explain it here in the, the PowerPoint. All right, so this is a map of what the various airspaces look like. Um, so I've got my mouse here. I'm going to try to point to stuff. So I'll start out with the Class A. So Class A airspace you can think of as like high altitude airspace. It's all the airspace above 18,000 feet. And the FAA actually has pretty strict requirements for who's allowed to go up there. You need to be on an instrument flight plan and you need to be instrument rated. So uh, there's no way any of our uh, paragliders or hang gliders could meet those requirements, so we're not allowed up there. Um, also, everybody who's up here is in communication with ATC and they're keeping strict separation between airplanes. Another thing is a lot of airplanes up here are going pretty fast, so it'd be hard to see and avoid them. Um, so below that, you'll see this blue section here is the Class E airspace. You can think of the Class E airspace as everywhere airspace. So if it's not designated on the chart and it's not right on the ground, it's probably Class E airspace. Oops. It's probably Class E airspace. So um, the next one is the Class G airspace that I want to talk about. You can think of Class G airspace as the ground airspace. It's usually along the surface. Class G airspace is the only airspace that's considered uncontrolled. Uncontrolled means that there's not an air traffic control agency who's responsible for separating aircraft in that airspace. Now, Class G airspace usually goes from the surface to 1,200 feet above the surface. Um, and then... Uh, the highest it can go is 14,500 feet. So, for example, uh, say we're over the town of Boulder. The town of Boulder, um, or we'll just say the surface is at 5,000 feet. The Class G airspace will go from the surface up to 6,200 feet. Above that would be the Class E airspace. Okay, and then that goes all the way up to 18,000 feet, and above 18,000 feet is the Class A airspace. 
All right. So there's a couple exceptions we'll talk about with that where the class G airspace will be lowered to 700 feet or even down to the surface, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. The next ones I want to talk about are the class D airspace. Class D airspace is usually around air, uh, smaller airports with a control tower, and it just looks like a cylinder. Now the class D airspace we're not allowed to fly in, um, and it only goes from the surface up to 2,500 feet. The next one is class C airspace. This is around busier towered airports, and it looks like an upside down wedding cake. So the center of it would be where the airport is, that busy airport, and it extends from there all the way up to the top of the class C, but they build a little shelf out. So once you get a certain distance away from that center, um, the airspace actually turns into E airspace until you get to this bottom shelf of the C, and then it turns into C again, and then once you get above that, it's class E. So um, it'll make more sense here in a little bit. I'll show, I'll break down the airspaces on the next slide. Class B airspace is similar to the C, except it's a lot bigger, and it usually has weird geometries, but it's a bigger upside down wedding cake. So we'll talk about these now. So let's talk about the class G airspace. So I said it usually goes from the surface to 1200 feet. So I took this little section here out of a sectional chart and we'll talk about where these different rules apply. So out here is the typical normal class G airspace. Um, so this mountain here is 6,674 feet. It's class G airspace up to 1200 feet above that altitude. And then, can you guess what's above that? Class E airspace up to 18,000 feet and then class A. All right, so now there's this little symbol here that's a shaded magenta. Um, you'll notice it gets uh, dark towards the outside and lighter towards the inside. On the inside of this, it means the airspace, um, the class G airspace is lowered to only 700 feet. So everything in here is class G airspace up to 700 feet, just like this, and then above that would be class E up to class A. All right. Now the other thing that this actually does pertain to us because we're not allowed to fly in this airspace is this class E surface airspace. So they'll put this magenta dashed line around airports within like um, more serious instrument approach procedures. And this right here means that there's no class G airspace. It's just class E airspace from the surface all the way up to 18,000 feet. Now, if you'll remember back in the regs, it's, the FAA says that we're not allowed to fly ultralights in airspace designated or class E airspace designated for um, an airport. So that would be this area right here. We're not allowed to fly in that. Okay, so I said class E's everywhere. So um, just looking at this again, you can see around the various airspaces, class E's above it or into these little corners here. All right, class D airspace is this cylinder that I was talking about before, and I've got this uh, cutout of a sectional chart that shows where we can find that. If an airport is blue, that means it has a control tower, and if it has this blue dashed circle around it, that means that it's class D airspace. All right, so remember, we're not allowed in class D airspace either. So as long as we stay on the outside of this, we're good. Now the class D airspace extends from the surface up to usually 2,500 feet above the surface, but that's marked on the chart here. So the minus 80 means it goes up to, but not including 8,000 feet. So it goes to 7,999 feet. So in theory, if you could stay over this class D airspace, you would be legal. But if you descend below 8,000 feet, you're in the class D and you're breaking the rules. Class C airspace um, is a bit bigger. So this is around Colorado Springs. So the class E airspace over the Colorado Springs airport itself goes from the surface up to 10,200 feet. Above that would be class E airspace. And remember that goes up to how high? 18,000 feet. So we're allowed to fly in the class E, but not the C. It probably wouldn't be wise though to try to fly over the top of this airport because if you can't find lift or you descend into the class C, you're breaking the rules. Now, this is where that upside down wedding cake comes into play. Notice on the sides here, there's this new number. It's a, a 102 over a 75. So that means the class C airspace in this box right here goes from 7,500 feet up to 10,200 feet above sea level. 
So that's like this little shelf right here. So below that is class E airspace. And actually, um, once you get closer to the surface, there's class G airspace. And then above 10,200 feet would be class E. And then over here, just because of the geometry of the mountains or the way airplanes come in, they've changed the, the heights out here to where uh, the bottom of the class C is at 8,500 feet and the top is 10,200. Usually it's a uniform top, but the bottoms are what change. So we would be allowed to fly under this as long as we stay below 8,500 feet. All right, so we'll look at the B airspace. So B airspace is quite a bit more complicated and you just have to look at the area that you're gonna fly to, de to decide where it is. So this is that huge upside down wedding cake over Denver. So you see the center here is Denver International Airport and the class B airspace goes from the surface up to 12,000 feet. So we can't fly anywhere in here. All right, as we go out to the sides above it, we'll see that the class B airspace goes from 6,000 to 12,000 feet. So below that would be class E and G airspace. So we would be allowed to fly under 6,000 feet now that would be pretty difficult if we don't have an engine, so this airspace might be kind of tricky. But as we get farther out, that shelf rises. So over here, the bottom of it is 7,000 feet. And as we go farther out, it's 8,000 feet over here. So in theory, if you were to fly this direction, you could, as long as in this box you stay below 10,000 feet, and in this box we stay below 8,000 feet. Again, I wouldn't recommend flying over the top of it because we have no control when we descend. So if you descend into the class B, that's your fault. And then um, I said earlier that the class A airspace is above 18,000 feet. And that actually goes up to 60,000 feet and above that's class E, but that doesn't really matter for us. Um, all right, so why do we care about the different airspaces? Well, basically, if you're in class D through A, you're going to be talking to an air traffic controller. That's why paragliders and hang gliders are not allowed in those airspaces. Class E airspace is still controlled airspace, but it, since it's such a large area, they allow us to fly in that, but there are certain rules that we need to um, obey. So, there are cloud clearance requirements. If we're below 10,000 feet, we need to stay at least three statute miles, or we need to have at least three statute miles of visibility. Um, and then we need to stay at least 500 feet below clouds, 1,000 feet above, or 2,000 feet to the side. So it, we wouldn't be allowed in class E airspace to thermal all the way up to and into the clouds. We would have to stay 500 feet below. Once we get above 10,000 feet, they change that requirement to make it a little bit larger because airplanes are flying faster. We need five miles of visibility. We need to stay a thousand feet above the clouds, a thousand feet below, and one statute mile to the side. All right, so the class G airspace is uncontrolled and there's a lot less requirements as far as the visibility and uh, clouds. And you can look at the chart here. I won't talk about the night because we don't really fly at night. But if you're in the class G airspace and you're 1200 feet or less above the surface, um, we need at least one statute mile of visibility and we can fly right up to the clouds, but we have to stay clear of them. So a couple other airspaces that we might come across are restricted airspace and military operation areas. Restricted airspace is this section here. This is actually just south of Colorado Springs. It's over the Fort Carson Army Base. Um, it's shown by this blue line with these hash marks and the hash marks point towards the restricted airspace. Now, Inside of the airspace, it's, it has a name. It's R2601A and B. Now, we don't know how high this restricted airspace is. It could be restricted up uh, 30,000 feet and above, and it wouldn't affect us. So we would need to look up this code, and you can Google it, or if you have a sectional chart, it'll say at the bottom where the airspace is. So sometimes the restricted airspaces won't be active, and we would be allowed to fly there, but um, you always need to check. Now... MOAs, or military operation areas, we are allowed to fly in those, but we need to be looking out for military traffic. These are areas that the military practices maneuvers with um, their jets or uh, their whatever airplanes they've got. So they might not be looking for us, so we need to be looking for them. Another one that I wanted to talk about is alert areas. So these are around um, 
airspace to basically warn you that there is a ton of air traffic in here. So this is one over the Air Force Academy, and they've got a note on the chart above here. It says, pilots are requested to avoid flight in the vicinity of the Air Force Academy due to intensive student pilot training and parachute jumping surface to 17,500 feet. And then it says C supplement for hours of operation. So that's like what I was talking about before. You can Google A260 and find the supplement and see when that alert area is active. You could fly through it, but you might be flying through a bunch of training airplanes, skydiving, and all kinds of stuff like that. And remember, we're supposed to give right away to airplanes, so we might be putting ourselves in a position where we're uh, being unsafe for those aircraft. The other one that we really need to watch for is temporary flight restrictions. These could pop up anywhere. Um, in Colorado, the co most common ones are due to fires, but once they put up a temporary flight restriction, it is illegal to fly in them. So you will get arrested, or it could be, I don't know, uh, depending on what type they are, they could be pretty bad. So these are some right now for uh, that I found in California. The one on the, the red one here is an active one. And that's because of the fire that's out there. And then this one right here is due to a, a VIP coming in there. So that for security of that VIP, they put up this flight restriction and we're not allowed to fly there. So for presidential um, VIP TFRs are usually like 30 miles in, uh, in diameter. So if the president came in or something like that, they would shut down the airspace and we wouldn't be allowed to fly. You can check these by going to a website called Sky Vector, which I'll show you here in a second and you can get uh, up-to-date temporary flight restrictions. One other thing that I wanted uh, people to understand what they are is Victor Airways and VORs. So a VOR is basically a navigation beacon that airplanes are flying towards and um, they'll follow these Victor Airways that you can see here, the blue lines here, and all these Victor Airways go to a VOR. So if you are planning on doing a towing competition, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to do one right near these VORs just because so many airplanes can uh, converge on these VORs. So um, staying away from these Victor Airways will ensure that you're away from airplanes. So just I mean, you're allowed to fly near them. It's just you should be aware that that's where airplanes are coming. All right, so I'll show you guys Sky Vector. If you just Google skyvector.com, you can pull up this entire sectional chart of the entire United States. Um, you can Google uh, different airport, or not Google, you could search different airports, and it'll pull, it'll snap to them. So I'll look up Boulder, it pops up here, and look at this. There's actually a TFR that's active for the next five hours, and this is because of the Colorado versus Utah football game. So... Uh, the nice thing about this website, if I go over it, it'll say the TFR is valid on this date. Uh, it says what time the kickoff is, and that's in Zulu time. So that's the time in Greenwich, England. It's the time that all airplane pilots use. So you can Google what time it is in Zulu time. Uh, it says when the TFR is effective, and it also says the heights. So this TFR is from the surface to 3,000 feet. So we would be allowed to fly over that, but if you descend into it, you're breaking the law and you can get arrested or a ticket or whatever they decide the punishment should be. I can also go around and look at, say I wanted to do a cross-country flight from Boulder, or we'll just say there. I wanted to come to here and say I'm trying to do this Wyoming flight that all of us are trying to do. I could set up a magenta line here and look to see what airspaces I'm going to come into contact with. So you'll see along here, I'm just in class G and E airspace, so there's no issue here. But as I come up towards Laramie, we see this. Do you guys remember what this is? This means the class E airspace goes to the surface. So if you remember that, um, that FAR rule that says we're not allowed to fly in airspace or the class E airspace that goes to us the surface for an airport. So we wouldn't be allowed to fly here unless I got prior authorization. So I could maybe Google who the controlling agency is here and get authorization if I was trying to go farther and break a record or something. So I hope this answered a lot of your questions. Um, feel free to leave a comment or contact me directly and I'd be happy to help. Uh, happy flying and yeah, see you out there.